Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. We scheduled this episode, an annual review of the Supreme Court term, many months ago, and as it turns out, for the very day when the court completed its work for the term and left the bench for its summer recess. But not before detonating several bombs in the form of decisions that transformed the legal landscape and American society in affirmative action, anti-discrimination, and student loans, among others. The Blitzkrieg began in earnest last Thursday with the announcement of the court's 6-3 opinion invalidating any consideration of race in college admissions. In effect, wiping out some 45 years of case law approving of the consideration of diversity in a strictly cabin framework. The opinion, while not unexpected, had a monumental quality akin to the court's decision last year in the Dobbs case overruling Roe v. Wade. The following day, the court let off two more explosions. Its decision in 303 Creative LLC erected a major exception to the 45-plus years of decisions upholding state and local anti-discrimination ordinances, which forbid businesses that hold themselves out to the public from discriminating on the basis of race, gender, and, in the case of many ordinances, including the one at issue in this case, sexual orientation. The court held that a website designer could not be required to adhere to such an ordinance because it would amount to compelled speech in violation of the First Amendment. Whether there is any limiting principle that would protect anti-discrimination legislation from further challenges is an unsolved riddle. And then the court finished its term by striking down the Biden administration's loan forgiveness program relying in part on its newly minted Major Questions Doctrine. The decisions were all joined by the same six justices who together make up a conservative supermajority that in its second term continues to seem determined to radically transform the law and society in a series of hot-button areas. And like the Dobbs decision, these most recent opinions figure only to add to the court's historically low regard among lawyers and citizens alike. The deep schism between the conservative majority and the three progressives was on vivid display in these last few days of the term, as several justices read lengthy excerpts of their opinions from the bench, a conventional sign of passionate disagreement with the other side. To take stock of another explosive end, this one to year two, of the new ultra-conservative court that Donald Trump built, we are fortunate to welcome three of the country's most thoughtful and savvy Supreme Court observers. And they are... Emily Bazelon. Emily's a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, co-host of the podcast Political Gab Fest, and the Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at Yale Law School. Her most recent book is Charged, the new movement to transform American prosecution and end mass incarceration. Emily, thanks very much for returning to Talking Feds. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Daya Lithwick, a senior editor at Slate, where she writes about courts and the law and hosts the Slate legal podcast, Amicus. She's also an MSNBC contributor and author of the book, Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America which we covered in our last Talking Books series. And she's also a returning guest and especially welcome for this Supreme Court annual episode. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Harry. And also returning, Melissa Murray, the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes professor at NYU Law School, the faculty director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network, and the co-host. We have three terrific uh, podcast represented by our three contributors, Strict Scrutiny, as well as being an MSNBC legal analyst. She is an author of Cases on Reproductive Rights and Justice, the first case book to cover that field, by the way, and a co-editor of Reproductive Rights and Justice Stories. Thanks so much for joining us on this Supreme Court final day, Melissa Murray. Thanks for having me, Harry. So let's begin with the final two cases of the term announced just a few hours ago on Friday as we tape. 
303 creative case in which maybe a website designer possibly wanted sometime in the future to avoid designing a website for a same-sex couple based on her religious objections. I give all those hedges because the case itself had a kind of manufactured quality. But in the merits of the decision, it continues a pronounced trend of solicitousness for the religious beliefs of at least some religious groups. The court suggests the case is a straightforward application of established First Amendment principles. Does that view wash? I would say no. This case was nominally a religious case because this woman understands herself as a Christian evangelical, but for purposes of the court's grant of certiorari, it was not a religious freedom case at all, which makes it very different from the case that preceded it, Masterpiece Cake Shop, which was decided in 2018. Here, the court took certiorari on this case, but explicitly did not pick up the religious freedom question and instead said it would only answer whether or not compliance with Colorado's anti-discrimination law, which requires anyone doing business in the public sphere to adhere to certain anti-discrimination norms, including not discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation. They only took it as a question of free speech. The idea here being that this woman who may make websites at some point in the future views herself as being compelled to speak a message about same-sex marriage with which she doesn't agree because she is forced to comply with this standard anti-discrimination law that everyone doing business in Colorado is required to comply with. And so the court here said that Colorado could not force her to adopt this message um, by forcing her to take all comers in her business. And that is the first time, to my knowledge, and you know, I'd be eager to hear what Emily and Dahlia have to say on this, but it's, to my knowledge, the first time the Supreme Court has used speech doctrine to invalidate an anti-discrimination law and to say that compliance with anti-discrimination norms is a form of compelled speech. I was going to say there's the Boy Scout case, but I think that's different and that you're right. And, you know, look, to take a step back here, one of the things that's important to me about this case is Colorado chose to pass this anti-discrimination law, right? Like, this is a state that wants to say that if you are a business open to the public, you have to serve everyone. And the court is getting in the way of the state providing that kind of protection and doing that in the context of same-sex marriage, saying that this website designer would be forced to convey a message of supporting this form of marriage that she thinks is false. And it's really an end run around what we've previously considered, I think, pretty settled law, that once you're open to the public, you have to serve everyone. And it's really not clear to me from reading the opinion what the limiting principle of speech here is, right? Like, what kind of service could you be providing where you wouldn't say you were conveying a message? Yeah, I mean, there are two questions embedded in Emily's comments. First, What kind of service, as Justice Kagan asked at oral argument, what if they're providing chairs? I mean, a website designer is really putting together an itinerary and the like. But the absence of a limiting principle just seems to scream out. There is at least 45 years since, you know, the late 80s of endorsement of cities that choose to have these anti-discrimination ordinances. And there's certainly nothing in the opinion that would distinguish from discrimination based on religious belief against other protected classes. The court would somehow assure us that wouldn't happen. But I was just thinking of the luncheonette cases in the 60s in which an owner comes forward and says, well, these are my religious beliefs. The pastor reinforces them every Sunday. And all of a sudden, the uh, requirement to seat people of all races becomes a kind of compelled speech. Is that too far-fetched, at least in legal reasoning, if not likely result as an analogy? I don't think there's a limiting principle that answers that question. You know, Melissa makes the point they used a bunch of compelled speech analysis from private speakers. They grafted it onto a business, which is different. And then we don't have any, I can't figure out from the opinion why, if my religion says that there shouldn't be racial intermarriage, why that is off the grid, right? There's nothing in here to protect against that. And so I think this case spirals, not just in terms of what is speech, what business isn't somehow expressive, and spirals in the other sort of vector of 
how would the state stop you from saying my religion prevents me from serving somebody who is HIV positive? It's just not clear at all to me where this goes. And I think, you know, you started with this premise, Harry, but I think it's right. I think this is so clearly part of a trend where some speakers have all the rights uh, and there are privileged classes of speakers, including, I think, religious speakers, if you think of Coach Kennedy last year, who just somehow trump everything else without having any meaningful sense of what it is other than their particular religion that's ringing the court's bell. Especially if you consider that the court in its conscientious objector cases and prison cases has disclaimed any effort to push back against the sincerity or bona fides of professed religious beliefs. I agree with everything that Dahlia and Emily have said. I actually think, though, it's beyond simply religious believers' objections. I mean, the fact that this is a speech case means that it is untethered from the prospect of the religion clauses. So it could just simply be, I don't want to say this anti-discrimination message that Colorado is making me say through its requirement of compliance with this law. So in that sense, it is actually quite broad. And I thought Justice Sotomayor did a bang-up job in the dissent, identifying the fact that, as Lindsay Lohan says, there is no limiting principle. The limit does not exist. She talks about a number of different scenarios, like, for example, If you're a photographer and you choose to do portraits of school children, can you go to the school to take photos and say, you know what, I'm not photographing the multiracial children because I don't agree with interracial marriage? The prospect of that would be absolutely abhorrent. I mean, it it sounds fanciful and far-fetched, but it's not that far off from what we're seeing in this opinion, and maybe that is the next frontier. So I actually don't know what the limiting principle is. It seems that the court has wiped away any prospect of a limiting principle. I mean, to be a realist here for a minute, do you think the limiting principle is that the conservative groups that have been getting these cases together will not want to bring that case because that will be embarrassing to them and the court would not want to hear that case either? And so we're just going to have a sort of, unless you have a plaintiff come forward with, in this case, it was a really hypothetical question that the court is answering, then that's why we'll be spared from the scenario you just, and so to my outline. Melissa, right? It won't be because the court has put it off limits. It's just that the same groups that bring these cases won't want to bring that case with the multiracial kids not being photographed. Well, I think about that irony. The conservative legal movement is the one to be exercising judiciousness and determining what cases they do and don't bring. Or maybe it's simply the case, like, we'll see a limiting principle if a Muslim American files one of these cases. Yeah, I mean, they have let loose a Pandora's box. You're certainly right that it's movement generated. But the principle is out there like a loaded gun. Let's say they don't go so far. No judge lets the objection to interracial marriage out of the box. But what about objection to, say, atheism or to some kind of plausible view that the movement folks might not want to bring? But here it is, 303 Creative. I I see this in the criminal area where something comes out and defendants suddenly jump on the innovative claim There's a lot of wacky, genuine beliefs out there. And I hadn't thought about Melissa's point. It it also seems unassailable to me. It's not, strictly speaking, a religious case. What is the whole sort of civil rights era forward, but something one could reconceptualize as, quote unquote, compelled speech or forbidding certain kinds of views that society as a whole finds abhorrent or the expression of them, the action on them? So that that does strike me as the especially pernicious broad case, even though in its impact, since the whole thing is almost not real yet, there's almost an unripeness to it. It won't have a complete sledgehammer impact. Let's go to the opposite side, the Biden student load forgiveness program, which has made hundreds of thousands of people, you know, $10,000 poorer today in a sense. So it wipes out in a strike under the newly minted major questions doctrine. Let's try to be a little legal and nerdy if we could on on this episode of Talking Feds and with these guests. So the major questions doctrine, I mean, no one had even heard of it a few years ago, and it seemed quite amorphous as it came into discussion. Does this opinion make that doctrine itself any clearer or more predictable? 
This is such an interesting moment. Justices Kagan and John Roberts go to the mat over that question. I mean, they're certainly the best legal writers on the court. I think of them as the two highest EQ justices. In other words, I think they're both very deft at reading the room. They are the two who have been most out front on this question of legitimacy of the court and what it means when the court takes reckless big swings and um, loses the public. And so this fight between the two of them, you know, at one level, it is a wonky legal fight about the nature of the major questions doctrine, which Kagan is just like, dude, this is just fake. (laughs) Uh, But at another level, like undergirding that fight that they're having, which is feels very personal. But there is this other fight about whether when you do stuff like this, you lose the respect of the country. And I find that incredibly interesting as a template. We can talk about whether or not there's such a thing as the major questions doctrine, but the fact that the chief justice and Elena Kagan are using this case to say, if you push this thing, you make us look like a joke. And him taking very personal umbrage at that, I think is fascinating. Just for your listeners, you know, the major questions doctrine is, I think, as Dahlia and Justice Kagan alluded to, you know, something that's sort of cooked up in a meth lab of conservative grievance. Wow, what a phrase. Did you just make that up? <laughs> no, I've been oh. shilling this all week. Um, no, but that ver- those six words, wow. Okay, go uh, ahead. I can just get it under five. I'm, I'm ready. Right. But the idea here is that Congress delegates certain authority to the executive and administrative agencies to do certain things. And typically, that's, this has given the administrative state broad authority to solve major problems that we deal with in our lives, things that we would not want to go to Congress to solve. Like, you know, no one wants to go to Marjorie Taylor Greene to get a passport. Instead, Congress has delegated authority to the administrative state to handle all of the administration around immigration and naturalization and passport control and all of that. So the major question doctrine argues that in circumstances where there is a question of high political salience, that when the administrative agency acts on one of those issues, it has to be acting pursuant to a very explicit and specific delegation of authority from Congress to the agency to do so. And so the question, of course, in the major questions doctrine is, what are these major questions of high political salience? And basically, in this made-up theory, you learn that the people who get to decide what these major questions are, are the justices themselves. So the major questions doctrine isn't about constraining Congress or constraining the administrative state. It's about arrogating power to the court. And the court gets to decide what is a major question when Congress can speak. And in this particular case involving the student loans, the executive here at the Department of Education acted pursuant to the HEROES Act. And the court essentially said, in acting pursuant to the HEROES Act to address an emergency situation, COVID, by relieving individuals with student loan debt of their loans, forgiving them, the um, Department of Education went beyond the scope of the statute, which did not provide explicit authority to forgive student loans. It talked about waiving certain things, but it did not specifically said you could eliminate or forgive student loans. And therefore, on this issue of major salience, the executive through the administrative state went too far, exceeded the scope of this authority. It means that in the future, if Congress wants to provide any kind of wherewithal for administrative agencies to act, they have to be really specific, um, especially if it's an issue of high salience and who knows what the court will find to be of high salience. And that really requires a level of clairvoyance that honestly, I don't know that Congress really has the ability to sort of determine and write statutes that can endure and address problems that we haven't even contemplated. Just to back up what Melissa is saying, the structure that we've had, like really since the New Deal, has been a government where Congress issues broad directives and the agencies step in and they have the expertise to write all the regulations and fill in all the details. And that creates a powerful executive branch that can do a lot of regulating. And this conservative majority doesn't like that kind of federal government and is clipping its wings. And we're going to see another test of that next term when they decide to review the Chevron doctrine, which is obviously made courts until now more deferential to agency power. It looks to me like that is also likely to be on the chopping block. And what's going on here generally? I mean, a few years ago, or maybe a few decades ago, we would have 
associated conservative legal thought with bullish views on executive power, including Chevron, which was insisted on by the Supreme Court. Now it seems launched on a project of greatly reducing the powers of the executive branch and especially the administrative state. Why the switch or how does this fit in with overall conservative legal doctrine, do you think? Let me be more crass about it. Is it is it specific to this executive branch or is this the new conservative thought, just a deep antipathy toward executive power, at least administrative power? I think the latter and, and not the former. I mean, I think at least for the last 25-ish years, yeah. the conservative legal movement has really been pushing this idea of the Constitution in exile, um, that, you know, this fourth branch of government, the administrative state, right. has overridden the three explicitly provided for branches in the Constitution. And, you know, there have been real questions about the administrative state because it does actually exercise a range of different powers, um, executive power, legislative power, rulemaking, and also judicial powers. Like there are lots of administrative judges that deal and work within these agencies. And they've argued for years that um, they are often removed. The administrative state and its actors are often removed from the political process. They're not accountable to the people. And they present these real issues of separation of powers. But as Justice Kagan said a few terms ago in a case called Gundy, which was also about the administrative of state, like there really isn't a better way for us to do government beyond the administrative state, at least not in a modern age. I mean, again, think of all of the ways in which we intersect with government. They're usually through administrative agencies, and no one wants to have to petition their congressman to go and get a passport or do any of these sort of routine quotidian things. Like a lot of this stuff is hashed out by agencies, by individuals who have more expertise in these specialized areas than do your average representative or your average senator. So I get where they're coming from. Like, you know, the administrative state isn't explicitly provided for in the Constitution. But you know what? Neither is executive privilege. And we seem to be okay with that. Look at the irony that Melissa just laid out, like the knock on the administrative state is these unaccountable, unelected, out of touch mm. bureaucrats who are making policy. So better to have the Supreme Court <laughs> unelected, out of touch, unaccountable, you know, Supreme Court justices who are now apparently deciding what a wetland is right after the Quick Clean Water Act case. So mm. there is both an arrogation of and we really see that in the debt relief case, you know, an arrogation of power to one decider only that, you know, sort of echoes in so many of the cases we've seen this term, which is this sort of imperial judiciary. You got a supine Congress. Everybody hates the administrative state. The president can't do anything right. You know what? Who, who gets to decide water policy? These guys. What could go wrong? And also, the court is doing this in the name of giving supposedly Congress more power, right? It's this idea of like, oh, Congress, please go be more specific. Tell us exactly what you want. But if you imagine Congress trying to write statutes at the level of detail that we now give to regulation and regulators, there's no way the congressional offices are staffed for that. And so really what you're talking about is having lobbyists write all the details in these laws instead of the career federal administrative agency employees who tend to sweat out the details and frankly impose stricter limits on corporations. All excellent points. I just want to do one quick echo of what Dahlia said with the Kagan-Roberts skirmishes, because, you know, Roberts does seem very smooth and unflappable for the most part, but where the court's legitimacy is questioned in that way, even if it's just an observation of what people will think, he seems thin-skinned, right? And that is the way to sort of make him bristle. And I think that maybe has implications for other things that are happening at the court. Okay. Hey, we just covered today so far. There's a few opinions yesterday that we haven't begun to touch on. Why don't we talk about the abolition after 45 years, ostensibly, of the use of race at all in affirmative action higher education? What do you think about the cases? Which, again, were no surprise. I liken this to Dobbs insofar as this is 
the overruling of Bucky and Grutter and Fisher, a whole line of cases that reaffirmed over and over again a principle that I think we all thought was not in dispute until it was, until the composition of the court changed. I think it's interesting that the court doesn't say it's overturning precedent. It just says, by the way, we've changed the rules, right? It requires Clarence Thomas and Justice Sotomayor to say, I think they just overturned almost 50 years of case law. But I put it next to Dobbs as an example of how, you know, stare decisis has no meaning anymore. You know, I know we're going to talk about the legitimacy questions, but I think when we find ourselves at this moment in these internecine wars about, you know, is there a loophole in these affirmative action cases? You know, what can you put in your essay? I think one of the things we're struggling with, and we really saw it with Moore versus Harper, where there was a massive intramural debate about the scope of the win there and, you know, whether there was a poison pill where the court somehow is planning to do this again. And I think it's so interesting that one of the reasons we don't know is because stare decisis no longer has any meaning. It's not a promise of consistency anymore. I think that's exactly right. Um, It does feel a lot like Dobbs. Say what you will about John Roberts and his refusal to explicitly say that they were overruling Grutter. They effectively overruled Grutter, and everyone saw that. I will say they also effectively overruled Lemon last year in Kennedy versus Bremerton School District and didn't talk about that either. And it's a standard move that John Roberts has made over the years. Like He will retool and retool and retool never actually say he's completely reordering the legal landscape, but that's exactly what happened. So this, to me, seemed entirely consistent. What I did take issue with in reading this decision was sort of the loose way in which the majority characterized the facts. These were constitutional plans. No one was using race as a determinative factor. Race was not a preference. These students were being evaluated on an holistic calculus that included a wide range of factors, among them grades, test scores, work experience, where they came from, socioeconomic status, and race, among many other things. And we can't say, and indeed, I think it's an actual question about whether there was properly jurisdiction here or even an injury. No one can say that someone lost their spot because it was given to someone because of race as opposed to any other factor. But in his majority opinion, John Roberts continued to reiterate these frankly racist shibboleths that basically equate any minority student attending one of these schools with the prospect of unearned largesse as opposed to, yes, this was a person, a holistic person with a lot of different factors in their application. And Among them, they are part of a group that historically has been underrepresented on this campus. And he just reiterated this idea that affirmative action fuels these stereotypes when he himself seems captured by the stereotype that no minority student could be in one of these places on merit. There's no other explanation for it. And Honestly, it was just it was surprising that he would do this in an opinion, Um, not surprising that he would rule in this way, but that he would parrot back these ridiculous shibboleths over and over and over again, even as he then laid waste to what I think has been the most effective public policy solution for remedying past discrimination and integrating those who formerly have been excluded from many institutions and places of employment into the body politic and promoting the kind of social mobility that gives rise to a multiracial, multiethnic democracy. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's connected to the non-overruling question, because in essence, they just are elevating now to law what had been dissenting views or maybe his sort of ipsa dixit from a few years ago, the way to end discrimination is to stop discriminating. You know, that's a view, not a view that all universities have adopted, but these plans, all of us know, has ever been within a mile of them, are lawyered to death to be painstakingly consistent with the letter of the law. And so that law has now changed overnight and dramatically, but without expressly saying so, which I think is really noteworthy. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to add that we have the conservative majority saying that 
from the time it was written, the 14th Amendment was colorblind, even though it was written following the Civil War to address all the evils of slavery during our brief window of Reconstruction at a moment when clearly the concern of Congress was the equal rights and some effort to try to make formerly enslaved people have a shot in American society. You know, now we have this very ahistorical reading of the Equal Protection Clause that is law. And then I think there's this other question, which I'm really interested in about what happens next in college admissions. Roberts leaves open the idea of, of course, people can talk about race as part of their life experience when they write their essays. He didn't actually say anything about considering economic disadvantage in some way that would intersect with race and injustice. But Justice Thomas and Justice Kavanaugh in their concurrences did talk about considering disadvantage in a way that made me think at least that they remained open to the idea that if your motive is racial diversity and racial justice, you can consider, quote, race neutral factors like wealth and income and whether a school or neighborhood is under resourced. And I just think all of that is amazingly unsettled now, and that's going to lead to a lot of future litigation. Another overlap with Dobbs, which had this air of, well, now we're settling it. And of course, it was nothing. But what was the point? So those final two paragraphs, you're having commentators range from that's the loophole to drive a truck through and things will be unchanged to there's basically no room there. But he ends the opinion with that and, and really seems to be serving up a way to achieve diversity, but more covertly, although more race consciously too. pity the poor, you know, admissions uh, reviewers who are going to get essay after essay after essay driven by the Supreme Court. What's the court doing? And they all sign on to it with those final couple paragraphs. And how big a counter principle do you see it as? One thing to be mindful of, Harry, is that, you know, there are a number of states throughout the country that have been operating in a post-affirmative action world for many years because of the imposition of statutory law, but also constitutional amendments. And you and I both know that California is one of those. In 1996, Proposition 209 was passed in a voter initiative, and it effectively removed the use of affirmative action in higher education admissions decisions, but also in hiring. Um, But it didn't say anything about the operation or administration of higher education programs or the organization of public workplaces. And you you can imagine there are lots of places where outside of admissions where questions about race or gender, gender is among the protected categories in Proposition 209, would come up. So, you know, in K through 12 education, I think it's pretty obvious that when schools are divvying up classrooms, they try very hard to split the classroom so that there's an even number of girls and boys. And technically, that is sort of dividing on the basis of gender. Proposition 209 does not speak to that specifically. And there has never been a lawsuit to determine whether or not doing so would be permissible. And I would say there are a lot of things that are still sort of untested in this post-affirmative action world, even the one that's been occupied for the last 20 years in California. Like, you know, you might think about race in the administration of scholarship programs or in how you decide to constitute your classroom so that students don't feel isolated in certain classrooms where race may be a sensitive subject or may come up on a regular basis. It's unclear whether Proposition 209 in California forbids that, and it's unclear from this decision whether there is any sort of long tail beyond what it says about the admissions process. And so I think what we are going to see going forward is not only schools adopting the sort of diversity statement that the court kind of gestures toward at the end, but there are going to be a lot of other questions about the administration of higher education that are not answered by this opinion. And I think conservatives would love for this opinion to just chill any of that experimentation full stop. But I think it's really incumbent on institutions of higher education to push the envelope to see what is permissible, because part of the game here is to sow enough confusion that people don't do things that they actually are permitted to do. Yeah, Harvard, as much as came out of the box yesterday and said, we're going to do that. And in a cheeky, really, part of Sotomayor's opinion, she basically said, 
they can do what they want. They don't understand the real world. And this will go on. Well, at oral argument, this came up a lot, right? And Justice Barrett and I think Justice Kavanaugh seemed concerned about the idea that you were going to tell people they could write about any aspect of their identity except for race. And I think also Sotomayor, I remember being concerned about this and maybe Kagan too. And so aspirationally, in terms of continuing racial diversity, what one hopes is that the court is saying that schools can still consider how racism is a form of adversity, that students face, that applicants can talk about, that schools can take into account and give credit for during admissions. Whether that's exactly what the court meant or not, I mean, I am not sure, but that's my hope for what it meant. I was just going to ask Emily if she thought that the majority's inclusion of that statement at the end was a nod to that actually devastating hypothetical that Justice Jackson posed in oral Mm. argument about whether or not two North Carolinians, one a legacy, one an African-American, could both talk about their family's history. And Patrick Strawbridge, the lawyer for Students for Fair Admissions, said, yes, the legacy candidate could speak of her family's history in the state and their long time, you know, attending the University of North Carolina, but that perhaps the African-American applicant could not talk about her family's experience of enslavement and segregation, which had prevented her family members from attending the University of North Carolina. And Justice Jackson suggested that that presented a different kind of equal protection problem and possibly a First Amendment problem. And I wonder if her intervention there, which I thought was devastating in the moment, also had another half-life in this opinion, in this last part of the opinion where the majority gave this nod to the prospect of these statements. That is such a good point to bring in, Melissa, and I hope that it had exactly that effect. I mean, certainly that was just such a, as you're saying, devastating illustration of what it would mean to not allow people to talk about their family history in this way. You know, I'll say this. I think there's going to be a sense out there in in terms of people's reaction that this question has been settled and settled in some chimerical way of colorblindness. And that's not going to be what happens in higher education going forward. You know, Melissa raises California and it's true. They've Pretty tough medicine. They that's. I think it's quite related to why they don't consider standardized tests uh, at all anymore. But it's just a testament to. Yeah, I just think universities just won't abide the kind of plunge in minority presence on campus. That you know, I'm thinking of people visiting elite schools and it looking like some weird 1950s Ozzie and Harriet land. And it's just schools just cannot let that happen. It seems to me. This feels like too cynical, but it's, you know, Friday and I'm grumpy. But I, I will say that um, there feels like such a through line between the debt relief case and this mm. case insofar mm. as the aggregate result, I'm sad to say, is that a whole bunch of students are going to feel like maybe they don't belong at university and maybe they shouldn't apply. And isn't it sort of extra tragic that those are the people who we thought uh, both of these things were operating to try to level the playing field? And so there's just a, a slightly frustrated part of me that feels like the net message at the end of this term is, you know, last term we went after women and we shored up guns and religion. This term, we just really are going to go after students and students who would be using the promise of education and all that we have erected to make education seem fair and that these are two huge roadblocks acting in some way in tandem to signal like, yeah, maybe don't even bother. You know, I hope I'm wrong, but that's where I am. <laughs> uh, man, there's, this is so much to discuss. So let's turn to at least briefly Moore versus Harper. I foresee a number of roundup articles in which paragraph three is, but the court also in Moore v. Harper, as if it's sort of a counterpoint and you know, making it overall a sort of 60-40 term. I guess the way I put it loads the question. So let me just try to objectively say, how, how big a counterpoint do you see the rejection of the independent state legislature doctrine in Moore versus Harper being? Is it a either monumental or surprising progressive result? And I'll add to the question, they could have gone with the mootness rationale that Thomas pointed out, and he really, they they did decide to address the question head on, how big a deal in the overall story is Moore versus Harper? 
So I'll say that I think they had to address it because just the sort of anti-democratic underlay of the independent state legislature theory slash fan fiction was so pernicious that I think it had to be addressed. But I don't think this was an unalloyed victory for democracy. I mean, I think this should have been shut down, and they did shut down the most extreme version of this theory, which is that state legislatures and only state legislatures get to make the rules for federal elections in their jurisdiction, and there is no role for state courts or state constitutionalism to play in checking them. And I think the court properly rejected that. But it is important to recognize here that the court kind of widened the Overton window and seemed to be crediting a theory from Rehnquist's concurrence in Bush versus Gore back in 2000 that there is some role here for federal courts to step in and check state courts when they are interpreting right. state constitutions. And the court is very clear about this. The state legislature is not unchecked. There's a role for state courts to play, but there's also a role for us to play in checking state courts. And so, again, widening the Overton window, making the Rehnquist off-the-wall theory on the wall and arrogating more power for this court to determine when it will step in and check state courts doing state constitutional law. And so to me, this was just classic, classic Roberts court, like a few sops to the democracy lovers in the crowd. But mostly this was an opinion for them that arrogates power to them. I totally agree. And I think the sort of Rick Hassan, Rick Pildes contingent who said this has planted a poison pill. This is, in some sense, codifying the Rehnquist opinion in Bush v. Gore that was a laugh line until it was the law. That is an Overton window shift. And I think Melissa's point, which is the right one, is that one of the ways that we have come to sort of, I think, misapprehend what's going on is that like not getting punched in the face feels like a win. And Moore v. Harper very much I class in the thank you for not punching me in the face. But by the way, this case was ridiculous. And the fact that the court doesn't always do the ridiculous thing can't be the new metric by which we, you know, write pieces about like the the noble 333 court or how Kavanaugh and Barrett have moved to the center because this case was insane. And I think this in tandem with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, Milligan, I think, say something about John Roberts, who used to hate voting until he does. I think it's somewhat interesting that Roberts has modulated on elections questions and not on affirmative action. I think that's a sort of interesting question that I don't quite have the answer to. But I just really put, I would say, both the Voting Rights Act case, Moore v. Harper, and I think actually the challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act case in the bucket of the court declined to do something absurd. And for that, we are truly grateful, but also that doesn't make it a moderate court. I'm just going to grumpily add that I really think this case was moot. I don't understand how it's not moot. And I hear you, Melissa, that they had to address the issue. And like it was all argued and briefed when the North Carolina Supreme Court switched from being Democratic majority to a Republican majority and reversed the previous decision that the court had granted cert on. But I just like fundamentally don't get this. It's time now for our sidebar feature, in which we ask a well-known person to explain an important legal concept in the news. The topic today is the Major Questions Doctrine. That's a doctrine the Supreme Court has begun to employ to strike down agency action in cases it deems of political or economic significance unless the agency can point to a specific grant of congressional authorization. It figured in the court's decision in the student loan forgiveness case. And to explain it to us, the perfect guest for our annual Supreme Court episode, Amy Brenneman. Amy Brenneman is an actress, producer, and activist, best known for her television show, Judging Amy, which was inspired by her mother, the Honorable Judge Frederica Brenneman which earned Amy two TV Guide Awards, three Golden Globe nominations, and three Emmy nominations. She's had a prolific acting career on stage, on TV, and on the screen. 
with credits ranging from NYPD Blue to the Pulitzer Prize-nominated Rapture Blister Burn at the Geffen Theater. Amy also hosts the podcast The Challengers, and she has been honored by a large number of philanthropic and civic organizations for her feminist activism. So I give you Amy Brenneman on the Major Questions Doctrine. In Biden v. Nebraska, the Supreme Court's final opinion of its just completed term, the court invoked the Major Questions Doctrine in holding that the Biden administration lacked authority to forgive the student loans for people who were affected by the pandemic. What is the Major Questions Doctrine? Since at least the New Deal, federal agencies have had great power to operate within the authority granted to them by Congress. Courts typically have given agencies broad discretion to interpret their grants of authority, so long as the agency's interpretations are reasonable and not expressly contrary to congressional direction. The major questions doctrine changes that normal regime in the case of certain, quote, extraordinary cases, end quote, of great economic or political significance. In such cases, the court will strike down an agency's action unless the agency can point to a specific congressional provision granting them express authority over that area. Courts have recognized the doctrine only recently, but it has been a long-standing ambition of certain conservative lawyers to get the courts to do so. The doctrine first received prominent judicial treatment in a 2017 dissent by then-Judge Brett Kavanaugh. The Supreme Court invoked it by name for the first time only a year ago in West Virginia v. EPA, in which the court struck down an Obama administration program to regulate greenhouse gas emissions after concluding that encouraging a transition to clean energy presented a, quote, major question, end quote. In a dissent in that case, Justice Kagan called out the court for abandoning normal interpretive methods, arguing that when their normal quote, method would frustrate broader goals, specific canons like the major question doctrine magically appear as got out of text free cards, end quote. Even Kavanaugh in his 2017 dissent acknowledged that the doctrine has a, quote, know it when you see it, end quote, quality. Similarly, the Supreme Court has stated that their identification of a major question comes down to their, quote, common sense, end quote. Critics also have noted that the effect of the major questions doctrine is to aggrandize the court's power. That is because the doctrine allows unelected judges to overrule the policy decisions of the elected branches that the judges deem, quote, major, end quote. For Talking Feds, I'm Amy Brenneman. Thank you very much, Amy Brenneman, for explaining the major questions doctrine. Amy is currently starring alongside Jeff Bridges and John Lithgow in The Old Man, which you can find on Hulu. And now, a word from our sponsor, the American Civil Liberties Union. Hello, I'm Sandra Park, a senior attorney with the ACLU Women's Rights Project. At the ACLU, we believe everyone deserves equal access to safe and stable housing. Fair housing is a civil rights issue because it's fundamental to creating a more just society. Where we live is not just an address. It's central to all of life's opportunities, what services, healthcare, jobs, schools, and transportation we can access, and where we can build community with our families. The ACLU is working to reduce mass evictions and barriers to housing opportunities that disproportionately impact Black women renters and their families and restore important housing protections to expand equal access to housing opportunities for everyone. To learn more about our efforts to ensure everyone has equal access to safe and stable housing, visit aclu.org. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we pop into the beer aisle for a closer look at the two main types of beers, ales versus lagers. And to help separate lagers from ales, It first comes down to one thing, fermentation. 
That's the process where the yeast does its magic to give the beer its alcohol content and carbonation. Now, ales are fermented with top fermenting yeast at warm temperatures, somewhere between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas lagers are fermented with bottom fermenting yeast at colder temperatures, between 35 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of their warm fermentations, ales can generally ferment and age in a relatively short period of time, three to five weeks. Lagers can take longer, up to six to eight weeks. The difference in temperatures and time means this. The quicker fermentation in ales, including stouts, hefeweizens, pale ales, and IPAs, creates a fruitier, spicier flavor that's crisp and refreshing. At Total Wine & More, we have over 1,100 ales, so you can explore all you want. Lagers, including Hellas, Pilsners, have a smoother, richer, more mellow and robust flavor than ales, thanks to their longer fermentation time. We can thank the Bavarian brewers from the Middle Ages for discovering the benefits of longer fermentation after storing their brews in ice caves during the winter. In fact, lager in German means to store, which adds up since lager beer was brewed, covered, and stored with ice harvested from nearby lakes. At Total Wine & More, we have an ice cave of our own filled with a huge selection of ales and lagers from around the world. Just remember the next time you enjoy one, give a little cheers to fermentation. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. There's so many huge chunks of what they've done this year. First Amendments, stuff, the Title VII, religious doctrine, etc. But in the time we have, we, I think they've also this year made such a big item that we have to confront about their ethics issues. It's broadened out certainly to Alito and Thomas. How much has it harmed the court and how much has it chastened the court? I can quickly say that three days ago, I would have said some of the moderation in the opinions was a mm -hmm. function of a chastened court. I think I was one of the people stupidly writing that it's entirely possible that Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett didn't want to be lashed for life to, you know, the jet setters who think that the law doesn't apply to them. But th that's no longer in evidence. I mean, I think what we saw in the last couple of days suggests that there is still a, a lockstep 6-3 conservative supermajority that appears to be, I would say, almost wholly unfussed by the hue and cry around the ethics behavior. That puts it very well. And by any of the arguments of the three, I mean, we could spend more time on their lonely position, but it felt like they were basically just ignored you know, as a ship passing in the night. Did you have thoughts about this whole ethics imbroglio, what's going to happen, how, how bad it is relative to past conduct, Fortis, et cetera? And, you know, will anything happen? I think it is bad. I think it's worse than Fortis. And I will just say, I, if you can imagine someone like Thurgood Marshall doing this, like, I think you know exactly how it would have ended with members of both parties calling for his resignation. And I think if someone else on the court, like Justice Sotomayor or Justice Jackson, were to do anything like what Justice Thomas has done or what Justice Alito is believed to have done, they too would be run out on a rail. I mean, it's just surprising to me that more people aren't troubled by this. And, and the Alito scenario, I, I think, really is troubling. The prospect of traveling with someone who has pending business before the court just seems a bridge too far. So yes, I think John Roberts, who is the court's institutional stalwart, had to have been perturbed by this. I think it may explain why he took the lead on so many of these high-profile decisions, exercising his prerogative as chief to assign the decisions and sometimes assigning the big decisions to himself. I think Justice Thomas's concurrence in the affirmative action case made very clear that he would very mm -hmm. much have liked to be the majority opinion. I also Great think point. it's worth noting that Justice Alito had some real dogs this term um, for such a senior justice. He really didn't have a lot of the high-profile opinions. I think Sackett was the most high-profile of the opinions uh, that he wrote. So maybe that is also the chief justice indicating to Justice Alito that he's still the chief of this court, whether they like it or not. And 
they've got to be pretty worried about this. But I don't think it's necessarily chasten them or chasten the way they do business in, in terms of their decisions. It may change the order in which they release these decisions. I mean, there was a very sort of slow roll up to this catastrophic last two days, but they haven't stopped doing what they do. I think they've just changed how they message it to the public. I hope that Chief Justice Roberts feels like he has some homework to do this summer of getting the nine of them on board for binding themselves to some kind of code of judicial ethics and setting up some kind of oversight mechanism for it. I mean, the court has Roberts's name on it, and its integrity has really been impugned, and they could fix this problem by making some rules for themselves and finding some mechanism for overseeing themselves that is They don't want Congress to do it. They absolutely can do it on their own. But of course, those are two very different projects for him. The code, I can see them swallowing hard and and absorbing. By the way, it's going to be pretty interesting. Alito and Thomas both got delays in the filing of their financial disclosure forms. I wonder what, what shoes are left to drop. But the sticking point that I just don't know how he brings home is the independent oversight. But it's so plainly called for. I just talked to Mark Elias today, and he made one point that I hadn't realized, but just of many. Alito's invocation of the hospitality exception to be flying in that plane totally doesn't work because the hospitality giver has to own the house or the whatever. Nobody owns a plane, even the biggest gazillionaires. So if you do any kind of regular legal analysis, there's an irony because that's what they don't do, they would surely be found on the wrong side of the, the ethical rules. So we've got only two minutes left in this very sobering and kind of titanic. I feel like we've only hit the the very, very big points, but it is of a piece. You know, as Melissa says, the, the explosions happened at the end of June. We scheduled this very episode months ago, knowing what, what might be uh, in the offing. But there are through lines that will, I think, be explored in the coming weeks. Let me just ask, uh, as a sort of variation on the normal five words or fewer, what are your thoughts, everybody's thoughts, on whose court this now is? Is this the Thomas court, the Alito court, the Roberts court, you know, the Sotomayor court? Just kidding. Any thoughts about who is the sort of central figure in the Supreme Court today? I will just say my five words are Roberts and Thomas taking turns. <laughs> nice. I'll say Roberts says I'm the captain. That's that weird Tom Hanks movie yeah. about the yeah. piracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, it wasn't clear that you were getting it, Harry. I want <laughs> I just want to say this has been one of the most quotable hours of any Talking Feds guest ever in Melissa Murray. <laughs> Emily Bazelon, can you match that? I like Dahlia and Melissa's answers better than mine, but I'm just going to add, Kavanaugh said, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that's so good. He's always saying that. What like He concurred more than anyone else. He's going to be the great concurrer. It's really true, but he, the, the great nice guy, and it's not a court of nice guys, is it? Uh, man, I'm in, I'm in trouble now, so I'll just say not quite anybody's. We are out of time for what's been a great discussion, although we've only really been able to touch on the biggest, most important, and most controversial decisions that came at the very end of the Supreme Court term. Thank you very much to Melissa, Dahlia, and Emily. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting daily video content breaking down legal developments in the news. You can follow us on Twitter, at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for supporters. This week, we posted a conversation with filmmaker Julie Cohen about her latest documentary, Every Body. Talking Fez is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and the spirit moves you to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. 
Submit your questions to questions at TalkingFeds.com, whether it's for Talking 5 or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in. And don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Olivia Henriksen. Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Danny Cordray, Rosie Don Griffin, and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Rhea Cohen-Gilbert, Emma Maynard, and Kalena Tano. Thank you to Amy Brenneman for explaining the Major Questions Doctrine. Our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.